Good morning. My name is Lauren McKinney, and I would like to thank you for joining us for our program evaluation series. The specific topic we're covering today is Title I, Part C, your migrant education program. So here's our agenda. We're gonna start off looking at our program evaluation series overview. Then we'll transition into statutory requirements, the program evaluation process, taking another look at our RNAA, our reasonable, necessary, allowable, and allocable. And then we'll start to go into closing with a few examples and then the other program evaluation series sessions. So to start off, we're going to look at what exactly is the program evaluation series, how many are we offering, and then again, why are we offering it? So this is the overall program description of the PES or the program evaluation series. This was on the flyer that was sent out uh, through our listserv as well as published on our website. I'm not going to read this to you. This is just a reminder that, yes, we are required to evaluate our programs. And as a side note, the program evaluation requirement is both a federal and state requirement as well. We are offering a total of nine sessions in this series. This is our third. We've already covered Title I Part A basic programs, parent and family engagement policies and programs. This is Migrant Ed. And then we'll go all the way through June 4th with the Title V Part B Rural Education Initiative, which includes our SRSA as well as our RLIS. We're offering this because we wanna make sure that if at any time you have questions about how to evaluate your programs, you have a resource to go to. So statutory requirements for this. As an FYI, as with anything that you're looking at that deals with ESSA, please keep in mind that your statute is your friend. Now, of course, we do have additional requirements and states have the autonomy to add a few other things if they should so choose to, just as long as we are actually in compliance with the minimum of what ESSA and the USDE ask, then we can, you know, make things a little bit more stringent if we'd like. If you want to see the actual statutory requirements uh, within your application, they are indicated in the provisions and assurances section of the ESSA consolidated app. So the first thing we're going to look at with our statutory requirements is the overall requirement under Title I, and then we'll dig a little further into Title I Part C. So when you go into ESSA, you'll see Title I broken down into your Part A, Part C, Part D, and then there's a few couple of other little things in there in between, like your parent and family engagement uh, as well. But what I'm going to show you now is the overall statement of purpose for Title I at large. According to statute, the statement of purpose for Title I, the purpose of this title is to provide all children significant opportunity to receive a fair, equitable, and high quality education and to close educational achievement gaps. Now, Part C statement of purpose says, the purpose of this part are as follows, to assist states in supporting high quality and comprehensive educational programs and services during the school year and as applicable during summer or intercession periods that address the unique educational needs of migratory children. To ensure that migratory children who move among the states are not penalized in any manner by disparities among the states in curriculum, graduation requirements, and challenging state academic standards. To ensure that migratory children receive full and appropriate opportunities to meet the same challenging state academic standards that all children are expected to meet. To help migratory children overcome educational disruption, cultural and language barriers, social isolation, various health-related problems, and other factors that inhibit their ability to succeed in school. And then lastly, to help migratory children benefit from state and any local systemic reforms. Overall program evaluation, this pulls again from for all of Title I, of which, of course, Part C, our migrant ed uh, piece would fall under this as well. But the program evaluation, the scope, it says that each state agency or LEA that conducts a program shall evaluate the program disaggregating data on participation by gender, race, ethnicity, and age while protecting individual student privacy, not less than once every three years, to determine the program's impact on the ability of participants. Now, one of the things to remember about this as well, even though this 
statute says that it's supposed to be once every three years. We know that in the state of Texas, we submit this information uh, annually. It's just part of what we do. Uh, and at any time that the state requests the information, we are, of course, required to submit it and because this overall helps the state be able to turn in its report to the secretary of the U.S. Department of Ed whenever we are asked. We know at a minimum it's once every three years, but of course it can be more often than that. Now, going into the program evaluation, part of the purpose of this, we're, we're checking the impact of the ability of the participants to maintain and improve educational achievement as well as graduation, to accrue school credits, to transition, to complete high school and obtain employment, and as appropriate, to participate in post-secondary ed and job training programs. So this was copied and pasted straight out of the statute. Another portion goes into evaluation measures that says, in conducting each evaluation, a state education agency or a local educational agency shall use multiple and appropriate measures of student progress. And then the evaluation results, each state agency and local education agency shall submit evaluation results to the state educational agency and the secretary and use the results of evaluations under this part to plan and improve subsequent programs for children uh, that are participating basically in that program. Okay, so one of the things I want to point out from here when we're looking at the program evaluation is the multiple and appropriate measures component. Sometimes we get stuck on quantitative data, which is lovely, of course, but it kind of depends on uh, when we do those assessments, of which we're, we're not necessarily doing those formal quantitative assessment pieces every day. Uh, we typically sometimes, I don't, I don't like generalization, so let me not say typically. Uh, what I noticed through observation is that we pull that data at the end of the year or at benchmark times. So we're looking at benchmark data, we're looking at star data, Depending on how proactive the campus is, they may be looking at uh, regular locally sourced data as well, like quizzes, tests, things of that nature. But we also cannot forget about uh, qualitative data as well. So making sure that the data that you're pulling when you're completing your program evaluation is comprehensive is very important. It's multiple and they're appropriate measures. Now within section 1306B2 of Title I Part C, there is a reference to what is called unaddressed needs. The statute says, funds provided under this part shall be used to address the needs of migratory children that are not addressed by services available from other federal or non-federal programs, except that migratory children who are eligible to receive services under Part A may receive those services through funds provided under that part or through funds under this part that remain after the agency addresses the needs. So let's break that down because that's kind of a mouthful. And there's actually like three separate parts of this one completely long run on sentence. <laughs> the ELAR teaching teacher in me is kind of, ah. So let's have a look at this. The first part says, funds provided under this part shall be used to address the needs of migratory children that are not addressed by services available from other federal or non-federal programs. So in short, that portion of this is, statute is saying, we can provide services and we are required to provide services to meet the needs of migratory children if they're not being addressed by other federal or non-federal programs. So if there are needs that this particular population has that are very unique to this population, and we know that to be the case, I can use my Title I Part C funding to address those needs. The second part says, except that migratory children who are eligible to receive services under Part A may receive those services through funds under that part. They're referencing Title I Part A when they're saying under Part A, because remember, this is all under Title I. So what they're saying there is, hey, use Title I funding, uh, Part A funding as well. Don't forget about you, that you can use Title I Part A funding. If those students, if that migratory child is eligible to receive services under your Title I Part A. Okay, this last part says, or through funds under this part that remain after the agency addresses the needs. So in short, if there's any funding left over after you've addressed the needs that are there, you can use your funding that's left over from your Title I Part C after you address the primary needs that are required within the statute to meet that student population needs. 
kind of a mouthful. But part one is saying, hey, use this funding to address needs that aren't being met through other federal funding or non-federal funding programs. Second part says, don't forget about your Title I Part A. Your students, if they fall under and meet that criteria, use your Title I Part A funding. Use this, think of this funding as kind of like in addition to, above and beyond. And then this last piece, through the funds under which the agency addresses, if there's money left over, use this funding for that. That is a mouthful, but that's basically when we break down this line in the statute, what it says. So think of your Title I Part C as like in addition, above and beyond what you're already providing if they're eligible for services under other, other programs, be it federal or non-federal or your Title I Part A. But make sure you do the bare minimum of your needs as well. And then what's left over, you can use this funding for that in addition. All right, let's look at the program evaluation process. So this next section covers the process very briefly. But then we look at the tool, a couple of examples, and then we do a sample evaluation. I want to remind you that nowhere in statute, nowhere in ESSA, nor in Texas Education Code, does it tell you how to evaluate your program. You can evaluate it any way you want to. Uh, the requirement is that you evaluate the program, but they do not tell you this is the formula to how you should evaluate your program, okay? The evaluation process at large just basically looks at what it is that I set out to do. What did we say we were going to accomplish? What we actually accomplished? And then to what degree we accomplished it? With your evaluation planning, you want to make sure that you plan it from the very start. So that includes collecting that baseline data. Your baseline data is very important because it, it's another way when you're looking at that multiple measures of data to be able to prove that your program and the activities and strategies that you did in that program actually assisted the students. It actually, at the end of the day, went back to improving student academic achievement. Now, data can be, you know, as we know, from a variety of places, and they should be multiple sources. You can collect them from like your budget uh, summary, if you'd like, because that's data lets you know how much you spent and on what and in which program and when you actually spent the funding. Your data can also and should come from your CNA. It should also come from your improvement plan, be it campus or district. And just keep in mind, if you don't have as much data as you would like, as you would prefer, when you're planning for next year, plan opportunities in there to collect data so that when you're evaluating the program this time next year, you have a more uh, comprehensive overview of the, your data and what impact it genuinely had on the program. Now, I mentioned that there's not a specific way to evaluate. This is one of the ways that the agency um, shared with us previously when we were under the Nickleby. It's a very generic process and it gets the job done. You can use this one. You can choose not to use this one, but here's an example. This five-step process starts off with listing your needs identifying your strategies, identifying the funds, reviewing the data, and lastly, evaluating your impact. So listing the needs, as you can imagine, comes straight from your CNA. You list the needs identified within the comprehensive needs assessment. What I've screenshot for you there is a piece of the tool that was used and that was shared by the agency when we were under the No Child Left Behind I will say that as of right now, we do not have a new program evaluation tool per se from the agency uh, under ESSA, but just know there's nothing in that tool that is so specific to Nickleby that you cannot use it to ESSA because it's genuinely just a strategy for this is how you can evaluate your program. You'll see there from the snapshot I have on the screen, it just goes over what the program was, a, a student achievement, that was the particular area or the area of focus is what we used to call them when we had the eight areas under Nickleby. It talks about the data sources that were reviewed. The backside of that forum goes over findings and analysis, so the strengths of the program and then opportunities for growth, what needs do we, do we have? And then lastly, it ends with the summary of the needs, which allows for you to prioritize out of all of these needs, which are the biggest bang for my buck, which ones are the highest priority, how are we gonna make this happen? So in your program evaluation process, even though it's the end of the year, we go back to the beginning and say, hey, what did we note? What did we identify? 
as needs for this program at the beginning of the year. Next, we go into identifying the strategies. Using the district and or campus improvement plan, identify strategies or initiatives that address these program needs and were connected to this federal program. What I've screenshot in here is a generic form or template for a campus improvement plan. At the district level, you use your district improvement plan if you'd like. When it's saying about identifying your strategies, we have now moved into the CIP or the DIP portion of the evaluation. The identifying of the needs was your CNA. Now we're looking at this is what we did to actually meet those needs. So the strategies that we came up with, the initiatives that we came up with, the programs that we actually engaged in, and programs meaning little p, the programs that fall under the overall Title I Part C program. You're looking at those, you're pulling them, and you're saying, hey, what did we actually do? What strategies did we implement? If you're looking at your improvement plan, and you're not using a software like our plan for learning, which um, one of our partner organization 806 Technologies offers, then you just pull from your paper um, or your electronic improvement plan strategies and action steps. So this comes directly from your plan. Still inside the plan territory, you have identifying your funds, which is step three. Identify the amount of funds expended to implement the strategy or initiative if applicable. So when they're referencing funding here, I'm also going to show you yet again another screenshot of an improvement plan because within the improvement plan under the resources category, you should have some funding there. That should list exactly how much we anticipate spending for that particular strategy and or action step. So by line item, if I'm gonna be spending funding under resources, I should have some funding there. You can also, of course, pull your budget summaries when you're looking at any uh, campus allocations that you have set aside so that you can see how much and where did we pull the funding and what funding did we use for this particular program. Step four is reviewing your data. Now we started off saying that you wanna use as much data as possible because we need those multiple measures of data. So with the step four, the reviewing of your data, your reviewing data identified to measure the fidelity of the implementation and the impact of the strategy or initiative on student outcomes, because it all goes back to student achievement. Everything that we do with our funding, be it federal, state, or local, should go back to how are we improving the overall education, the academic achievement of the kids. So what I have here is another screenshot of a CNA. This is just one of the tool sheets that was there. As I said before, pull data from your CNA, pull data from your improvement plan, uh, student achievements. So that could be your benchmark data. That could be your locally created assessments. Um, pull data also from sign-in sheets. You know, your results of surveys, if you're actually engaging in survey practices or forums with your stakeholders, look at trend data that you may have over time. What I have here is I screenshotted a curriculum assessment. This one, of course, is made up. You see the students here are Ariel Mermaid and it goes all the way through Yosemite Sam. But this is just a reminder that you can pull actual data from your locally sourced um, assessments as well. This is not going to just be STAR, it's from a variety and multiple sources. So after I reviewed the data, I now go into the final step, which is evaluating the impact. So let's step back and have a look. Step one was identifying the needs. So because it all starts with that need assessment, based on the needs that we identified for our Title I Part C or our migrant education uh, kiddos, our migratory children, we created strategies, we sought out initiatives so that we can address those needs that we found in the CNA. So step two then was looking at our actual needs. Step three was where did we get the money from? How much did we spend? Where did the funding come from? So identifying the funding that was there. We then went into step four with, okay, we've done all these things. Now I wanna find out uh, with the step four, whether or not the data shows that this was beneficial for us to have this program. And the very last piece of this is going to be to evaluate your impact. 
you're evaluating the impact and making recommendations for continuation mod or modification of the strategy or the initiative. So basically, I have a heat map here, which is just another way of looking at your overall data. And we're saying, OK, based on all of these steps we've done, we're at the end. Was the impact of this program, program meaning Big P, the Title I Part C Migrant Education Program, was it beneficial to the students? Was this worthy of the resources? Was it worthy of the investment of the time? Was it worthy of everything that we put into it for this particular unique student population? Did they benefit from this? Okay. If they did not, then I need to have a look at this again and say, hey, do we want to continue this? Do we want to continue it with the modification? Or do we just want to stop whatever this particular strategy or initiative is altogether? Maybe it's an awesome strategy or initiative, but not the best to meet the needs of our student population. That is the program evaluation process in a nutshell. Uh, now, this particular format, as I said before, you do not have to use. This is what was recommended to us uh, by the agency when we were under No Child Left Behind. But it does not mean that that has to be the way you evaluate your program now. You can evaluate it in the manner that best illustrates the needs and uh, the direction that you chose to go with their student population and whether or not that direction was beneficial to overall student academic achievement. Next, I'm going to show you reasonable, necessary, allowable, and allocable. I have Title I Part A there because typically people default to Title I Part A when you're thinking about your RNAA. But just remember that this also, when you're thinking reasonable, necessary, allowable, and allocable, also applies to all of your federal funding sources. Okay, You, you legitimately want to go back and have a look and say, hey, uh, did we actually allocate the funds and serve the students and this program in the manner that we set out to do? What did the funding we spend on any of these things actually benefit the students? Uh, does it actually support the intent of the grant and the funding that was supplied for this? Okay. You want to make sure that, you know, we're accomplishing overall those objectives of the program and that we're implementing the activities that we actually described within the application itself when you did your ESSA consolidated application. You want to make sure also that we're doing what's considered prudent practices. And then lastly, you want to make sure that this actually goes back and benefits, again, your students when it's all said and done. So let's break this down a little further. When we look at what's considered reasonable, this is the full kind of checklist that the agency provided for Title I Part A. It says determine the reasonableness of a cost by determining whether it meets the following. The cost is of a type generally recognized as ordinary and necessary for the operation of the organization or the grant performance. Restrictions or requirements are imposed for generally accepted sound business practices. Individuals are acting with prudence in the circumstances of responsibility, and there are no significant deviations from established practices. That pretty much covers what's considered reasonable. Now, how the state defines allowable, to be allowable to be charged to a grant, the cost must meet the following criteria. It must be reasonable for the performance of the grant and be allocable under the applicable cost principles. Conform to limitations or exclusions set forth in those cost pr principles. Be consistent with your policies and procedures. That is a very important piece because when you're looking at, let's say you were to come in and do an audit of your own LEA, you want to make sure that there is consistency across your policies and procedures and that there's a uniformity to your federally or state funded activities. You, there shouldn't be a, well, this time we do it this way and next time maybe we do it this way. You, you want to be consistent with those policies and procedures. Moving on with allowable cost, be accorded consistent treatment, be determined in accordance with GAAP, which is your generally accepted accounting principles, not be included as a cost or used to meet the cost sharing or matching requirements and not be used for lease purchases. Now, allocable is slightly different. The following guidelines apply to allocable cost. A cost is allocable to a particular grant in accordance with the relative benefits. It is incurred specifically for the grant. So the benefits are both for the grant and the work and can be distributed. 
any cost allocable to a particular grant or other cost objective may not be shifted to other federal awards to overcome funding deficiencies. You, you wanna make sure that you're, you're keeping the funding where it is supposed to be. Um, that's all I'm gonna say about that. Make sure that it is meeting the needs of the program that the funding was actually allocated for. So that is a very, very fast definition of uh, what we call your RNAA. If you have additional questions about that, please feel free to reach out and let us know. So the next thing I wanna show you are some sample program expenditures. Uh, and I just wanna kind of walk through whether or not they're allowable or unallowable. So here's the first. And this is not specific to McKinney ISD. This is McKinney Elementary School because my last name is McKinney and I wrote out the examples. So McKinney Elementary School family and community liaisons utilize Title I Part C funding to conduct outreach activities for migratory children and their families. This included helping families fill out the CHIP paperwork and gaining access to social services. So the question then becomes, is this something that's allowable to be charged to Title I Part C? Keep in, in mind those three parts that we broke down when we looked at the purpose of this particular uh, subgrant under Title I. This is allowable. To the extent feasible, such programs and projects will provide for advocacy and outreach activities for migratory children and their families, including informing such children and families of, or helping such children and families gain access to other education, health, nutrition, and social services. So keep in mind those three parts that we indicated when we looked at the purpose of the program. So if this was something that we could have, in fact, charged to Title I Part A, if this was something that would have met the needs under that particular subgrant, then you for sure want to have a look at that. However, since we're talking here about this is specific outreach for this specific population, then yeah, this would have been an allowable uh, charge to that grant program, given that you've exhausted other applicable avenues. Here's our next example. Jodell Elementary School utilized Title I Part C funding to pay for mentors for specific staff members to educate them in meeting the unique needs of their migrant student population. So the question is, is this something that would have been allowable to be charged to the Title I Part C? This is a common example of what we do find. This is allowable. To the extent feasible, such programs and projects will provide for professional development programs, including mentoring for teachers and other program personnel. Now, it says state applications services there at the top because this is something that the state can do. But as a recipient of the grant funding here as an LEA, we are allowed to do this as well. So to the extent feasible, we are allowed to provide PD, including mentoring for teachers and other program personnel. So if I were going to use some of this funding to pay for mentors for specific teachers who are working directly with that specific population who have their very unique needs, this is something that you can consider using this funding for. Again, given the fact that it you've exhausted other funding sources and it does not apply uh, specifically to those other grant funding areas, either federal or non-federal, this is something that is listed in statute as a possibility. Here's another example. Aria is a high school student who receives migrant education services. She is unsure if she wants to go straight into post-secondary education or explore the pharmacy technician certification option at her local superstore. Can Principal Hyde use Title I Part C services to assist her with transition services? This is allowable. To the extent feasible, such programs and projects will provide for programs to facilitate the transition of secondary school students to post-secondary education or employment. Keep in mind, again, this means that I've gone through the other options for funding, and I found that this particular service, this particular program that we're going to offer to help with the transition services is unique to this population. And she is, in fact, as we said here, receiving migrant education services. Last example. Three and a half years ago, Penny received migrant services. 
As of November of the school year, Penny no longer meets the eligibility definition of a migratory child and has not made a qualifying move. The services and support that she receives is unique to this program. Principal Molinar wants to utilize Title I Part C funding to continue supporting Penny. Now, this one I kind of gave away because I have all of these uh, technical terms here with the quotations and all of that, but this is a question that we have received before. And you'll be happy to note that continuation of services, notwithstanding any other provision of this part, includes a child who ceases to be a migratory child during a school term shall be eligible for service until the end of such term. A child who is no longer a migratory child may continue to receive services for one additional school year, but only if comparable or comparable services are not available through other programs. And three, secondary school students who are eligible for services in secondary school may continue to be served through credit accrual programs until graduation. So this particular example specifically reports or references uh, number two. Even if a child is no longer technically considered a migratory child, per statute, they can receive services for one additional school year, okay? But keep in mind, as we stated when we started off, those three parts of the purposes of Title I Part C, that second portion of it referenced your Title I Part A, like, hey, don't forget about that funding that's there. If this child falls under your Title I Part A services, if they're eligible for Title I Part A services, use Title I Part A funding. This is basically what number two is saying as well. A child can still receive services for up to a year after they're no longer considered a migratory child, but just make sure that there are no comparable services or other programs that are available. If there are not, then that would be an allowable usage of that funding source. So now I want to briefly look at an example of, hey, how would I evaluate an example? So we're going to go back to the Jodell Elementary School, utilize Title I Part C funding to pay for mentors for specific staff members to educate them in meeting the unique needs of their migrant student population. So if you remember the five steps that we have here, how would I actually evaluate that particular activity or strategy or program, meaning little p program, a small portion of the overall Title I Part C? So the first step using the example that we have would be to list your needs. So when I look at this, because this listing the needs would need to come straight from the CNA, I have to look at this and say, hey, on this back end of it, I'm assuming that, and again, I'm assuming because this is an example that I got from an actual call we received. Um, so if I were actually within the LEA, I wouldn't have to assume I would know because I would have that data. But from looking at the example here, we can say, hopefully, <laughs> it was listed as a need for staff members to uh, get additional assistance, to get some mentoring as a strategy so that they can um, be better advocates and uh, learn better techniques with meeting the unique needs of their migrant student population. So that need then turned into the strategy of I am going to offer a mentoring program for those specific teachers who are working directly with that specific student population group. Identifying the funds. Well, within the improvement plan, I should see somewhere in there on that line item for that action or strategy, this is how much we anticipate it costing for us to actually implement this mentoring program with these specific teachers who are serving the unique needs of our migrant population kiddos. And that again, identifying the funds would be in the improvement plan, be it district or campus. It could also be in your budget. Well, it, it's not a can. It should also be in your budget summaries, anywhere that you are having uh, cumulative uh, funding analysis, you, you wanna pull your data from there. With that same example of the mentors for teachers working with that specific student population, now I wanna review data. The data should be multiple measures and should come from a variety of sources. So I can, that data can come from, let's say a survey, maybe at the beginning of the year, we did a survey with those particular uh, educators and asked them very specific questions about meeting the needs of that particular population, our Title I Part C migratory students. It could also be data that we pulled from uh, student achievement. 
how did that particular set of students do academically before the program started, the mentoring services, little p, and then afterwards. Um, also looking at evaluating the impact, now that I've looked at the, the needs, we looked at the strategies that we put into place to actually meet those needs. We identified where we got the funding from, and we looked at data to see if there was an actual impact on the overall student academic achievement. Now I can decide for this particular strategy or action of this Title I Part C program, whether or not the impact was significant enough that I want to continue with it. Is it worth the investment of the resources, be it the time, the funding, the manpower? Now that I've completed that five steps, I can go back and say, hey, I think that this is based on our data. Our committee has decided that we want to continue this particular uh, program of the mentoring uh, for teachers or staff members who work specifically with this very unique population to make sure that their unique needs are being met. That's it. That's an example as to how you would evaluate that particular strategy or action or program, the mentoring program with the little p. You could do that and you would do that for each of the um, sources or funding or charges that you are trying to allocate to the particular program, Big P, Title I, Part C. Overall evaluation of Title I, Part C, your strategies, uh, your impact of the program itself. That is exactly how you would do it for the program at large. Okay. That's it. We're going to transition now into beginning our closing pieces. So other program evaluation series you'll see here, this is the same flyer that I showed you earlier. I've already put a line through the April 23rd because we are going into closing pieces now for the Title I Part C. Next week, we'll cover Title I Part B and then keep on trucking until we get to June 4th, which is going to be Title V Part B. If you want additional resources, remember the statute is your friend. You want to go to the U.S. Department of Education if, to pull it directly from there. Uh, it is also on the TEA's website, of course, and you can also pull it from our particular site. If you go to uh, region10.org slash Title I, we have sections there that will redirect you from our Title I Part A page, also to our Title I Part C. And if you're wanting to see the actual, uh, let's say, general, how did you pull the program evaluation guidance booklet or how did you pull like that CNA snapshot, that tool that we mentioned earlier? That is also on our Title I Part A uh, site, which is just region10.org slash Title I. If you scroll down that page to the bottom, you'll find your program evaluation booklet. Yes, it does still say Nickleby because as I mentioned to you earlier, we do not have one specific to ESSA. But again, the process is the process. You can evaluate your program in any way you see fit, just as long as you can uh, have documentation and data to support. This is the reason why I evaluate it this way. These, This is the result of the evaluation. This is why we're going to continue or we're going to alter or cease that altogether. That program evaluation and the program evaluation tool is very general in nature. Uh, we still have that there because it is a good resource. The program evaluation booklet, which kind of has some facilitating questions, how to start thinking about the process, you can find on that website as well. If you have any addition, additional questions that we were not uh, able to address during our time together, please do not hesitate to let us know. Reach out. We are here to be of service to you. And here is our team in Special Revenue Services. Amber Lazane is our Assistant Director. Tony Garrett is a program coordinator over a statewide initiative called the Title I Capacity Building Initiative. Laura Griffin works with our private nonprofits. Becky Book works with our state allotments and uh, ESSA SSA. I'm there in the middle, Lauren McKinney. I'm a consultant of the ESSA SSA as well. And Jodell Bland is as well. So if you have any additional questions and we did not address them, you have further questions, unique circumstances, you want feedback, reach out to us. We are here. Thank you very much for your time. And I look forward to seeing you at an upcoming event or the next program evaluation webinar. Have a great day.